anyone with ears to hear, listen. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and summoned the elders of the church. When they came to him, he said to them, You know from the first day I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears, and during the trials that came to me through the plots of the Jews. You know what I did not avoid you know that I did not avoid proclaiming to you anything that was profitable or from teaching you publicly and from house to house. I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus. And now I am on my way to Jerusalem, compelled by the Spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there, except that in every town the Holy Spirit warns me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. But I consider my life of no value to myself, my purpose is to finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. And now I know that none of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you because I did not avoid declaring to you the whole plan of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will rise up even from your own number and distort the truth to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for three years I never stopped warning each one of you with tears. And now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that I worked with my own hands to support myself and those who are with me. In every way, I've shown you that it is necessary to help the weak by laboring like this and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, because he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. After he said this, he knelt down and prayed with all of them. There were many tears shed by everyone. They embraced Paul and kissed him, grieving most of all over his statement that they would never see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Acts 20, 17 through 38. This is the word of God. Amen. You can have your seats. Good evening, beloved. I'm so excited to jump into God's word with you tonight. Uh, a question to start us off. And, and I don't mean this in a morbid way, but in a, in a hopeful way, uh, a meaningful way. Have you ever thought about what you want your last words to be? Like if, if you were to know, these will be my last words, what would you want those words to be? Um, there's a lot of weight that comes into that. If we look throughout history, we see how a lot of people, their last words, they carry so much weight, especially on those that they love, people that look up to them and so forth. Um, some noted examples that I found this week, um, have you ever heard of James Donald French? Uh, James French was a convicted murderer. Um, he was actually the last man to be executed under the death penalty in Oklahoma. Um, as he was um, getting prepared to be um, executed um, by electrocution, mind you, um, he looked out to the gathered press on the other side of the window and he said, hey, fellas, how about this for a headline for tomorrow's paper? French fries. His <laughs> last name was French. Um, or how about Marie Antoinette? Uh, Marie Antoinette, um, we, we know her from history, if you've taken world history. Um, so um, this is in the French Revolution. She's French royalty. And Marie Antoinette was charged with treason. So she's carted disgracefully across the town to the guillotine where they're going to behead her. And as she's coming up and she takes her place on the stand, um, she ac accidentally steps on the executioner's foot. And her final words were, pardon me, sir, I meant not to do it. <laughs> you think, huh. Well, if you know the history of how she just lived this absorbent lifestyle while there were thousands upon thousands starving to death um, for her to tell the executioner she's sorry, she meant not to step on his foot, and those to be her final words. Our words matter, and they matter immensely in the face of a goodbye. When you know that you're not going to see someone again, those final words can have so much significance. And tonight, as we continue our journey through the book of Acts, um, we, we've seen this character, Paul, who's come in, and now it's like um, the majority of this book now is just kind of following him as he is being faithful to the mission Jesus gave the church to be his witnesses. And so he's taking this gospel, this good news, that God so loves this world that even though it's broken and in rebellion against him, he sent Jesus, his son, 
to come and save it. If we'll just put our faith in him, believe that he lived a sinless life, died an excruciating death in our place, the death that we deserve, but then he rose again. So we're confessing him as Lord and we're following him, trusting him for salvation. And so we're supposed to tell the world about that. We're to be his witnesses. And so that means that we will actually speak this. We will tell this good news. You share news by sharing news. And so we tell this good news, but we also demonstrate this good news. So we are a gospel voice and a gospel presence that because of the way that God has loved us, we now love others. That means that we have eyes to see the unseen. We have a heart for the hurting, for those who are lost and so forth. So we want to engage in acts of justice and mercy, good works that God actually saved us and prepared these good works for us to walk in. So that is what Paul is doing. He's the pioneer pushing this gospel further and further into the known world. And so as we've been following and we've got to know him considerably, we've watched him walk through suffering, we've walked through friendships and all kinds of ups and downs with him and he comes to a point today where we're going to see what he has to say when he knows that this is a final goodbye. It's not necessarily that his death is looming, but he knows that he will never see this group of friends again. And so um, there's gonna be a lot of weight to what he says. So this starts us off in Acts chapter 20. We are looking in verse 17. So picking up. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and summoned the elders of the church. Recall that he has spent years at this point in Ephesus, building up the church, raising up leaders, and all the crazy things that have happened there. So he sends for these elders in Ephesus. When they came to him, he said to them, you know from the first day I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears, and during the trials that came to me through the plot of the Jews. You know that I did not avoid proclaiming to you anything that was profitable or from teaching you publicly and from house to house. I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith and our Lord Jesus. So Paul brings the Ephesian elders together one last time to address them. And verse 21 just kind of captures the heart of his entire ministry. It says, I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus. And that is the gospel and a statement. The repentance, we turn from our sin, confessing we are broken, but we need a rescuer. And we turn to the rescuer and we put our trust in him. It is God himself, namely his son, Jesus Christ. So we're confessing that. Paul preaches that and he says, look, you've known this has been what I've done all along. And he picks up in verse 22. It says, and now I am on my way to Jerusalem, compelled by the Spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there, except that in every town, the Holy Spirit warns me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. But I consider my life of no value to myself. My purpose is to finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. How admirable is that? How beautiful is that? What a heart Paul has. That I consider my life of no value to myself. I'm not living for me. I'm not living for Kevin's preferred story anymore. I'm living for God's story. Paul says, no, 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 not for Paul, but for Christ." continue for him. And so I press on. And so much so that the Spirit has already kind of forewarned me that every city that I come to, what, what waits for me there? Chains and affliction. That I'm just going to keep suffering for this. And we recall Paul's story of when he was converted. He was someone who was trying to kill all the Christians or put them in jail in the very least. He wanted to extinguish the way, as it was called. This movement of followers of Jesus, he wanted to put an end to it. And when he encountered Jesus, Jesus warned him, you're going to suffer a lot for my name's sake. And so Paul knows this is coming, and yet he's saying, I count my own life as nothing. It's of no value. I just want to complete the ministry that is set for me. Like I want to run my race. I want to stay in my lane and see it through to the end that I preach this gospel. Man, verse 25. And now I know that none of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you because I did not avoid declaring to you the whole plan of God. And that's an allusion back to something that that God prophesied through his prophet Ezekiel and, and saying that there's a watchman over the city and the watchman's duty is to warn the city. When the enemy is coming and destruction is near, you warn the city. And once you've warned the city, you've done your due. And now you get out of there and their blood is not on you anymore. But if you were to flee your post and not warn the city as a watchman, 
then their blood is on you. And so Paul is saying, that's actually a picture of us preaching this gospel, that it is our responsibility. Yes, God is sovereign, he knows everything, and he will save, but that is our responsibility, to preach this gospel, to be his witnesses, to be obedient in this mission, take this gospel to the world. And Paul says, I have done that, I have not held back. And this is one of those many, many sermons that I like to throw in, but maybe right now you, need just, need to, you just need to ask the question, have I held back? from the whole counsel of God to someone, that I owe that to them. That maybe it might be a hard conversation, but you in love and grace need to have that conversation. Have the conversation. So he keeps going. Verse 28, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And what, what a responsibility. <laughs> that God has called you to lead this church, his bride that he purchased with his own blood. Look at the worth of her. How beautiful is the church? How beautiful are we? Because God has made us such that our worth is now found in the very life of the son of God. He purchased us. The cost of that purchase was his blood. How incredible, how incredible. So do a good job, guys. Be on guard. Be on guard for yourselves and for the flock. So if you think that you were called to engage someone and help lead them through something, he's saying, first check yourself. Be on guard for yourself and then for the flock and lead well. Verse 29, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will rise up even from your own number and distort the truth to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for three years, I never stopped warning each of you with tears. <laughs> He's leaving, and they won't see him again. He says he knows for certain that he knows they will not see him again. And so these are my last words to you guys. Be on guard. People are gonna creep in from the outside, but people will even creep in from the inside. Some of our very own will start to distort the truth and they'll try to lead you away from this gospel of grace. So yes, I know that I'm going to all these cities and every city I come to, chains and affliction await me. But I'm pressing on because it's not about my preferred story. It's God's story. I'm gonna live for his story and I'm gonna be joyful in it and it's gonna be beautiful. And he's promised he's working it all for my good and his glory, so let's go. So yes, it's gonna be hard for me, but you also need to be on guard for yourselves because as I leave, people are gonna come in and they're gonna try to lead you astray. They're gonna try to warp this gospel. They're gonna pervert it. They're gonna distort it and do all kinds of malicious things trying to build a name for themselves instead of a name for Jesus, the name above every other name. And so what do you do? Guard that. He warns them. He's not the only one coming into danger. There are threats against the gospel of grace that are coming their way. And so what does he say they need to do? Look at verse 32. And now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that I worked with my own hands to support myself and, that those, and those who were with me. In every way, I've shown you that it is necessary to help the weak by laboring like this and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus because he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. After he said this, he knelt down and prayed with all of them. There were many tears shed by everyone. They embraced Paul and kissed him, grieving most of all over his statement that they would never see his face again, and they accompanied him to the ship. Well, this is a sad goodbye. Now, you imagine... Paul has just spent years investing in these people. He's endured hardships. This is the city where the crazy riot broke out, where they were screaming and shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians for two hours and just losing their minds. Like he's encountered crazy things here. And they've gone through this together. You know that experience builds tight bonds. Like when we go through things together, it draws us together. And so he is close to these men. He's labored. It's, he's actually like at his own sweat, blood, and tears. Like he has labored with these men. He's invested his life. He said day and night for years and with tears have not ceased. He's put a lot of his life into this. And now he's going away and he's saying, look, you gotta be careful because some people are gonna try to lead you astray. And so what do I leave you with? God and his word. 
He points to his own example of how he lived a life that was worthy of being followed. That follow me as I follow Christ. He showed them this is what it looks like to follow Jesus. So follow my lead in this. So look at how I have lived while I've been among you. He tells them, don't forget about Jesus' teaching on generosity, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And we know that like actual secular psychology has proven over and over and over in our own lives that people who are more generous are far happier. Like we, we, but we tend to think like, the more I get, the more, the more happy I'll be. But no, it's the people who give away radically that are actually the happiest people. It is truly more blessed to give than to receive. So he points them to that, and then he says his goodbyes. You just imagine that moment. This is hardcore Paul, like, apostle. I'm not crying. You're crying. I'm not crying. No. But there's tears all around. This is sad. So we have to ask the question, what if there is such a real threat? There's a real threat that people could be led astray. Paul knows that, and he's forewarning them. This is coming. So what does he entrust them to? What would be their guard against the coming threats to the gospel of grace? And he said it in verse 32. So look at verse 32. He said this, And now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. So what will keep them? God himself and his word. What will keep us, beloved? God himself and his word will keep us. That's our bottom line for the whole the evening. God himself and his word will keep us. We have got to cement that into our minds and our hearts, that it is God himself who holds us. Jesus said, I hold them in my hand, the Father has given them to me, and no one is greater than the Father, no one can pluck them out of my hand. He's holding us. Nothing can take us from him. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. He has us. He will keep us. But it's also his word, the word of grace, his gospel. And so we need to understand the gospel is that God saves us and we never graduate from that. That God saves us is for the believer, that means he has saved us. It has happened in the past. Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished. It is already done. We have been saved. And yet he is saving us. He is currently saving us. And there is a coming day when he will save us, that he will complete the work that he began in us. And so this is not something that we ever graduate from. The gospel is always to be central. And it is God, his salvation. And this is why so often the prophets and all the way in through Revelation that the people of God would just scream out in moments of worship and just being overwhelmed by the grandeur of God and his design and just say, salvation belongs to the Lord. It's his and he gives it freely. He will keep us. So we will be kept by God himself and his word. And Jesus told us this. In John chapter 15, Jesus said this, Quite famously, in John 15, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes, and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I in you. Watch the shift in tense. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. You have been saved. Remain in me, and I in you present tense, remain in me. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Beloved, let's produce a lot of fruit. A lot of fruit. A life full of fruit. But if we're going to do that, Jesus is saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. You're a branch, and I'm the vine. And what does a branch do? It produces fruit, but it can only produce fruit because it's connected to the vine, and it's the vine that is pushing nutrients through the branch that ultimately produces the fruit. And so we can do nothing on our own, but we stay attached, we remain and abide with him, the vine, and he, pr he produces all this by pushing it through us. 
So it is God himself pushing that through us. And so how do we open that conduit? How do we see that we are going to be a church producing a lot of fruit? We remain in him. We abide in him. And he actually has this kind of interchangeable idea and this continues throughout the New Testament that there's, there's not a way to cleanly separate God and his word. They're inseparable. In fact, John opens his gospel by saying the word became flesh and dwelt among men. That God's word, that is his presence. That is where we go to feast. As branches, you want to feast and produce fruit? You go to the vine, you go to his word and you listen to him and he pushes life into you and through you, producing more and more. And how beautiful. We're always taking things in. All of us are always taking things in. And so we have to ask, like, what is it that we're actually taking in? And you think about the, the contrast in our lives of like how much of God's word of life are we taking in daily bread, as Jesus called it, that we need this for our souls. We need this more than food, he says. We need his word. And you think about how much do we come to this versus how much are we taking in all of the rest of our culture? You know, the, the average American spends 11 hours a day taking in media. And by media, I mean communication outlets or tools used to store and deliver information or data. So all of media trying to push information to us, and we're always taking it in, and I'm not saying that that is bad. I'm not saying at all that this is a bad number. But that's our reality, that we are taking in 11 hours on average of media a day. That much information pushed into us. And then how much time are we allowing God to speak into us? This is not at all a guilt trip. I just want us to see the necessity of being with him, abiding with him. Because 11 hours is two-thirds of our waking hours. Two-thirds of your time conscious a day is consumed by other things pushing into us. So how much of that will we say, let's make sure that it's good stuff, that it's God, it's life-giving word of God coming into me so I can produce fruit and remain in him, to abide with him. Church, I want, I want you to be a healthy church. Um, I, I, I was actually, I um, had a conversation with someone while we were doing setup this afternoon, and it was one of the most encouraging things I've heard. There's another church in town um, that's growing, and it's, and it's a beautiful church. I love so much of what they're doing. It's incredible. And yet, um, this conversation between some of them there actually came back to one of, one of us, and, and the conversation was, I can't quote it because I'm terrible at remembering things like that, but it was something to the effect of, like, we've heard about Beloved, that's, that's, that's a church that just cares about actually being together. Like, they're not trying to do the big church thing. They're just trying to be together in community. Yes! <laughs> yes! To be the people of God known for loving each other. That is what Jesus said we would be known for as his followers. So yes, yes, that is what we are. And let's be that. We're not in the business of growing a big church. We've actually told you already, like when we grow to a certain size, we're already praying for when that day comes, like that we will send out and we'll start yet another church because we want everyone to be in genuine community, to be long, to be known and be loved. But we invite others into that constantly. And so what that means is I don't want a big church. We want a healthy church. I want you, I want to know you. I want to be able to sit across the table and have a drink with you and talk to you and see where you're at because I want to know that you are healthy. I want to know that you are following Jesus and you are falling more and more and more and more in love with him. And as we do that, we'll love each other more and more and more and more. We want to be a healthy church. And so Jesus is saying, you want to be healthy? Well, branches have to stay on the vine if they want to be healthy. So just spend time with him, be with him, enjoy his presence. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus and abide in him and his word. And my own personal um, time with God this, this past week, um, it just really struck me. I've been working through and I got to the beginning of Joshua. And so you have this whole Exodus story where God has saved his people, the Israelites, out of Egypt from enslavement. He brings them through this wilderness. They've crossed the Red Sea. They're, a whole generation has to pass before they're actually able to, prom, to enter into the promised land. And so Moses finally dies as the leader and he kind of passes the torch off to Joshua. And so now Joshua is kind of the new leader of the Israelites and he's gonna lead them into this conquest of Canaan, of the promised land. And so there's this whole big get up, like we're getting ready to move in. And the first city that they're gonna come to is Jericho. 
And there comes a point where Joshua is, is ready to move in and he's moving on and Joshua is walking along and all of a sudden he sees a man. He sees a man who has his sword drawn. And so the implication, you just imagine, Joshua is walking along. There are millions of Israelites behind him. Like there, there's battle formation. They've been given rules and everything. Like the ark is gonna go so far ahead of you and everything. But like, Joshua sees this lone man, and so Joshua, as the leader, starts to approach. And you just imagine, why does a man have his sword drawn? He's not just like, ah, oh, this is a little time. Like, no. Like, that means he's ready to fight. He's ready to fight. And so Joshua is kind of, you just imagine, he's like apprehensively coming up like, we cool? <laughs> and so he asked him, are you for us or the enemy? I'm not really sure who you are. Are you for us or the enemy? And what, is, what does this warrior say? Neither. Neither. I command the Lord's army. And all of a sudden, like, Joshua's blown away. Wait, what? And this man holding a sword says, take your sandals off. You're on holy ground. So Joshua takes his sandals off and he's like, what does my Lord want to say to me? As he falls down in worship. And so now we realize this isn't just the command. Who is the commander of the Lord's army? The Lord himself. And so Joshua is worshiping. He's in the presence of God Almighty who's holding a sword and says, I'm not fighting for you or them. I fight for myself. But Joshua starts to worship because how beautiful is that? The God is fighting for himself, but in fighting for himself, he is for us. He loves us. And how beautiful to have that right perspective of God that he is not about our name, he's about his name, but his name is that he has married us. We are now his bride, he loves us, and he has proven his love by dying on a cross for us. And so this warrior holding a sword, Joshua falls at his feet and worships. And so my mind immediately just starts to question, why? Why did God want to show up in this moment and just say, take your feet, like clean them off. You're on holy ground, sandals off, fall and worship. Yes, and then I'll give you some weird marching orders for how we're gonna take Jericho. But why did God need to show up in that way? Just to say, take your sandals off. The same reason that he's approaching every one of us as a mighty warrior that is for us. He's for his name, but he's for us because he loves us. Because he wants us to just spend time with him. Like Joshua there, just come be with me. And I have something I want to tell you. And you imagine that? Like you need to hear that tonight. The God of the cosmos wants to spend time with you with you. He has things that he wants to tell you, like specifically you. And so will we stop? Will we take the time to just pause and rest and abide in him and listen to him as he speaks, to just be with him? Will we listen? Church, let's be known for spending time with God and being in his word. Let's talk to each other about what we're studying in God's word what he is saying to us as we experience and encounter him in his word. Let's talk about that. Find someone this week. Find someone that you can read through scripture with, that you can just have continuous dialogue with. Let's be known for that, abiding with him. Because the bottom line again is that God himself and his word will keep us. It is God himself and his word that will keep us this week my, my family, uh, my wife is a teacher, and so um, son is out of school for Monday, and uh, it's a teacher work day, but my wife's school does a lot of extra hour stuff, and so their, their school is actually basically closed. Like, the teachers didn't have to go to work, so we have a family day. And so for the afternoon, we went over to the beach, and we haven't been able to take my daughter. She's two. She hasn't gone to the beach near as many times as we take my son, um, but we're all there together, and there comes a point where Elena, this two-year-old, wants to go into the water and so she goes around like in her ankles and everything and she's collecting shells and it's fun and everything but there comes what she sees me and Leland my five-year-old we're out in the waves and we're having so much fun and she's and she wants to go she wants to go out into the big waves and so I get Leland back to shore and he goes to play with something and so okay Elena let's go out we're gonna go out in the big waves I want to go in the big waves I want to go in the big waves and so I take her out and this two-year-old 
I'm holding her, both of her hands in my hands. She's in front of me, and I'm walking her along, and I, and I walk, the wave, first wave comes, and she's, ah, and it crashes into her, and it's so exciting. Like the surge of water just flooding around her and everything. I've got her, and she's up above the water. She's okay, and just wave after wave crashing into her, and we get out a little more, and I'm, I'm letting her experience this. And she, I can watch her as she's kind of building this healthy level of fear and like respect for the fact that like this is strong. The ocean is strong. These waves crashing around me can get me. And so she'll kind of venture away and then she sees another wave coming and she turns around and runs back to me. I grab her, you're okay, you're okay. Crashes into her. Ah, she's laughing and everything. You can kind of simultaneously see like the terror in her eyes and the smile on her face like this is awesome. And I'll let her go a little. And sometimes I'll let her get knocked around a little because I want that respect to grow. But all the while, like, I'm there, like, I can grab her at any moment. But why? Because I'm holding her, and she's having fun. She's, she's loving it. She's experiencing it. She's genuinely participating in it. So much so that when we get out of the water, a few minutes later, she's like, Daddy, I want to go in the wave again. I want to go in the waves again. And so in that moment, I can think, like, you want to go in the wave or you want daddy to take you in the wave? But it's both. So she is genuinely going in the wave. She's participating in it. She's experiencing this reality. And yet all the while, I'm the one holding on to her. And I've got her. And is this safe? You can bet your life. It's safe. There is nothing that's going to keep me from keeping her above that water. I have her. And so as she goes through these waves, she can ask, can I jump the wave again? Yes. Yes, you can. Because I'm holding you and I'm keeping you. And she knows that daddy is not going to let her go. He is going to hold on to her and I'm going to see her through. And you may be thinking right now, yeah, until you like step on a stingray or something, Kevin, like the world crashes down. I get it. I'm human. But you know what? God is not going to fail. He's actually the one who walks on the waves. And in this beautiful picture of when Peter was sinking because he started to doubt as he saw the wind and the waves and he's sinking and he cries out, Lord, save me. This beautiful picture of the gospel and Jesus in his sovereign hand reaches down and grabs him and pulls him up and then walks him to the boat. That is our God. That is dad holding us in the waves that yes, we are really experiencing this and there are waves coming and they're crashing around and so much so that Paul said, hey, even amongst you, some people will rise up and try to lead you astray. This is an insane planet, but I've got you. So you just trust me and you stay in my word and I will keep you. So let's be people who are not shaken by the waves that we will move on and we'll enjoy this. We'll delight in this and say, can I play in the waves, Father? Yes, you can, because I've got you and I'll never let anyone take you. So let's stay in him. Let's be people of his word because again, the bottom line is God himself and his word will keep us. And that is why Paul said so long ago, I'm leaving and you will not see me again, but I commit you to God himself and his word of grace because God will keep us. Abide with him. Spend an insane amount of time just wrestling in his scriptures, listening to him. He wants to speak like that warrior coming up to Joshua. Oh, who do you fight for? Are you fighting for us? Or fighting? Neither. I fight for myself, but I love you and I have you. I'll never let you go. I have something I want to say to you, so will you listen? Let's listen. Will you pray with me? Father, we love you so, so much because you have proven your love for us. And so God, we thank you because we see day after day after day how we fail constantly and, and God, we don't measure up. So we confess that. <laughs> we confess you to be such a mighty savior. Your forgiveness, it's incredible. And it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. And that is just mind-blowing, that you are gracious, that you are loving, that you are compassionate. And you came after us. 
as Paul told these leaders of this church, that you purchased this church with your own blood. God, let us as beloved never forget that. That we are a people called together to make much of you, Jesus, because of your great love, love that cost you your life. So we love you and we love each other. Would you hold us together, holding your gospel as you hold us? So let us be people of your word. Let it just pour from our tongues constant. Let it be something that just directs every aspect of our life. That we would be wise and we will rock in your way. So we want to hear from you. Would you speak even in these final moments as we sing to you, God? Would you speak to us? Remind us of your word that will never pass away. So we love you. We commit all this to you and your glory. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.